Good morning and welcome to our Tuesday, Tuesday, not Tuesday, that was very country, <laughs> Tuesday, y'all, <laughs> our Tuesday NCCT uh, review. Um, we're going to be starting with claims. I sent a video out last week. Um, Hang on, y'all have disappeared on me. There we go. Now I can see y'all. Um, and you guys were to watch that video and then we were going to go through the questions. Now today we're going to do one through 19. I know that's not a lot, but I would rather be able to talk about the ones that we miss and I would rather go through a little slower so you guys have time to write down what you need to study more and that it gives us uh, more conversation time instead of rushing through them and you not remembering anything when it comes test time, right? So let me share my screen. Okay, can you guys see the NCCT interactive review system? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm just going to go down and we're going to go into the interactive review and we're going to start with the claims process. Okay, I don't know why it keeps doing this, but give me a second. I want to get back to number one. And look, I'm not even reading it. I'm just... Oh, I got that one right and didn't even read it. Okay, so number one, which of the following requires a patient signature for the medical facility provider to be paid by the carrier? SOF, ABN, PP, and RA. So SOF is signature on file. ABN is advanced beneficiary notice. NPP is national provider something. I don't ever remember the next P. And RA is remittance advice. So what do you have to sign in order for your provider, your doctor, yourself, sign in order for the doctor, doctor to share records? Do you have to sign for that? Yes. So anything that takes your medical information and sends it to somewhere else, you have to have a what? A signature on file. So that's the answer. Which of the following requires a patient signature for the medical facility provider to be paid by the carrier? I know it's kind of a weird way that they ask the question, but the answer is signature on file. And let's get the uh, rationale. SOF stands for signature on file. This abbreviation is used on a claim form and means the provider has a document that has been signed by the patient stating that the provider is allowed to accept payment on behalf of the patient. An ABN, an advanced beneficiary notice, is a notice that is that a patient signs agreeing that he or she will pay for a procedure because it is already known the insurance company will not pay for the particular service. NPP stands for, oh, I was wrong, Notice of privacy practices. This outlines a patient's privacy rights within a practice. RA stands for remittance advice, which is a document provided by the insurance payer and explains the re reasons for payment, denials, adjustments, and etc. As a biller, your butter and bread is in remittance advices because that gives you all the information that gives you how much they're going to pay on the claim. And it also tells you why they're not going to pay. And then you have an opportunity to go back to the claim and make some corrections and resubmit it. So you guys are not really expected to know that now until you start billing. Uh, but I wanted to give a little bit more explanation to a remittance advice. Okay, now we just talked about the assignment of benefits on the last rationale. So... The assignment of benefits form is used to allow the insurance company to pay the provider directly, pay the beneficiary directly, 
pay for the services provided, bill other insurance companies. <laughs> Is it B? Yeah, oh, it's AB. Because it says benefits. Okay, assignment of benefits form is used to allow the company to. Okay, so when you go to the doctor and your insurance pays, do they pay directly to you or do they pay directly to the provider, to your doctor? Go right. oh, to the doctor. So an assignment of benefits form is used to allow the insurance company to pay the provider directly. They're assigning who's going to get the benefit um, of the money. So the answer is going to be A, they're going to pay the provider directly. When a patient sees a new physician, one form that is filled out as part of the new patient's paperwork is an assign of benefits form. This form states the patient is allowing the insurance company to pay the provider directly. Now, imagine if they did not sign that assignment of benefits and they wanted the benefits to go strictly to them and they decided not to pay the doctor. That's a huge issue for a provider, isn't it? Because they're going to pocket that money and what are we going to do to collect, you know? Okay. An advanced beneficiary notice must be signed. We talked about this in the first rationale. Before a series of covered services, prior to the start of any surgical procedure, before a service which is not covered is provided, prior to a procedure when the risk of death is high. C. C. Let's. Yes, that is right. An ABN is used to let the patient know that a service that is going to be provided to the patient might not be paid or processed by Medicare. And guys, they use Medicare a lot because everybody uh, forms their rules around Medicare's rules because they're the most strict. This must be filed in completely, filled in completely and explained to the patient that he or she may be responsible for the charges in the event the services are not covered. This is always done prior to any of the services being performed. A patient presents for a procedure that Medicare will not pay for. Which of the following should the billing and coding specialist do? Collect payment in full before the procedure. Ask the doctor if only the allowable should be billed. Have the patient sign an advanced beneficiary notice. Obtain a letter of medical necessity. We just talked about it. C. 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 Sign an advanced beneficiary notice. Let's see. Absolutely right. An advanced beneficiary notice or ABN is a form that Medicare requires all health insurance health care providers to use when Medicare does not pay for a service or procedure. Patients must sign the form to acknowledge that they understand that they have a choice about their health care procedure or service in the event that Medicare does not pay. Choosing to proceed with a service or procedure holds the patient financially responsible for payment in full. Okay, we're going to choose three. Which of the following signed documents should the insurance and coding specialists obtain from all new patients. Insurance eligibility, HIPAA acknowledgement, financial responsibility, ABN, and assignment of benefits. B. Yep, that's right. Now let's, let's, let's look at E. Did we just talk about that they have to sign that assignment of benefits so the provider gets paid, right? Yeah, it pays directly. Do want to go with E? So what about? 
We do D? insurance eligibility, so it's not A. Is it D? D? Advanced beneficiary notice. Now remember, that's something we pull out for them to sign before so services C. that aren't going to be paid. Okay. But C. they need to C. sign a financial responsibility stating that they're financially responsible. So an ABN kind of falls under the financial responsibility. It's just a different kind of form. So it's B, C, and E, I think. Let's double check. Yes, it's B, C, and E. Every new patient should receive a copy of HIPAA guidelines and sign an acknowledgement of it. A financial responsibility form should be signed by the parent guardian acknowledging financial responsibility. Anybody that has kids and brings them to the doctor, you know we have to say, we're going to pay. <laughs> Assignment of benefits needs to be signed, giving the office authority to bill on his or her behalf. Number six, in order to determine if a claim is delinquent, which of the following reports must be generated? Daily balance report sheet, an AR aging report, analysis report, or batch report. Okay, so what does delinquent mean? means behind, right? You're behind on payments. You haven't made a payment. So delinquent and aging in this scenario, that should give you a clue. If a claim is delinquent, you're not going to uh, rely on your daily balance report. Analysis report, that's a broader report. And a batch report is whatever you've billed in a day. At the end of the day, you have a batch report saying what batches you have to be billed to insurance. So the answer is going to be the aging report. Does that make sense? So aging. So that's right. The AR aging report is a report of all delinquent patient accounts. It includes how long the accounts have been delinquent and how much money is owed. A daily balance report is generated to show the money generated in a day. A batch report shows all the encounters that have been billed out in the groups in which they have entered, been entered. Just a second, let me take a sip. An analysis report is a very broad term. <laughs> See, I told you it's a broad, that can mean any many different things in the healthcare world. Almost any data that is can be formatted into a report can be called an analysis report. So I'm just gonna talk to you about billing. So say that, for example, my when I billed cardiology, encoded cardi cardiology, we would print an aging report every week to find out what hasn't been paid and why. So if, for example, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield denied a payment on Mr. Smith. They denied the claim. We're not paying it because it was not authorized. So I would find that on that aging report and I can go back and look for an authorization number, update the claim and resubmit it. Just a second, Sean is texting. Sorry, she's having a hard time getting in. Number seven, patient AR aging reports relieve staff of time-consuming activities such as tracking office expenditures, collecting dollar amounts and outstanding accounts, preparing office income analysis, completing insurance claim forms. Now let's kind of narrow it down, okay? So AR aging reports, is it tracking, tra uh, tracking office expenditures? No. no. Nothing to do with that, right? Collecting dollar amounts and outstanding accounts? No. Preparing office income analysis? No. Completing insurance claim forms? What do you think? Just give it 
B? Let's go with B. Yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> I know that was a little bit of a guess, but it was a good one. The patient AR aging report is a report of all delinquent patient accounts. It includes how long the accounts have been delinquent and how much money is owed. This report can save the office staff time consuming activities such as counting dollar amounts in outstanding accounts. This report is only used to track outstanding balances owed for services rendered. All right, number eight. To determine whether a claim is delinquent, which of the following reports should the insurance and coding specialists generate? Aging analysis, patient analysis, reimbursement analysis, practice analysis. Hey. A. <laughs> Good job, uh, Sapphire. I agree. Yes, it's aging. The one thing I love about these reviews uh, of this is it gets you an op it gives you an opportunity to really get to know some of the things like the aging report. It shows you different questions uh, that that can be the answer for. Which of the following reports shows in detail the invoices that are overdue for payment? B. <laughs> See, you're going to know all about aging reports now. You're not. Gonna know. <laughs> <laughs> Which of the following ledgers should the insurance and coding specialists use to calculate cash, credit cards, and checks received from all patients during the business day? Is it A? All right, we're going to go with A. Let's go back. No, that's the first word. I mean, the last word. All right, let's go back again. Which of the following ledgers should the insurance and coding specialists use to calculate cash, credit cards, and checks received from the patient during the business day? Total charges and total receipts. Okay, so when you go and there's a total charge, they're not going to um, expect you to pay for what your insurance is going to pay, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to have you pay that uh, the copay, which is what you've contracted with your insurance. So it's the total that they received. So let's just look at the uh, summary or the rationale. The day total receipt should be used to calculate all the payments for the day. Charges and adjustments are not um, are not payments. An EOB is a document sent from the insurance carrier and is not a payment. So Sapphire, I would have gotten that one wrong too because I wasn't <laughs> thinking about it that way. So that makes you feel any better. The physician requests the amount of monies unpaid on all accounts. The insurance and coding specialist should run the report for insurance. B. <laughs> what? B. B. <laughs> you didn't even let me read all of it. Let's see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> account An account receivable aging report will break down claims by the number of days unpaid. This report can be used to reconcile the oldest cases first. Number 12, a claim that is not missing information is called <laughs> dirty, pending, clean, or scrubbed. See? see. <laughs> Let's see. Absolutely right. A claim that is not missing any pertinent information is called a clean claim. A claim that is missing information is called a dirty claim. A scrub claim has been reviewed by a third party, such as a clearinghouse, and the errors and the errors are missing information have been corrected. A pending claim is a is being reviewed by the insurance carrier. To verify that multiple CPT codes may be billed together without being considered unbundled, the insurance and coding specialist should query. <laughs> B. 
Okay. A. I was going to say A. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, A. So we want to go with A. I can't think of a way to explain this one. So we're just going to go with the rationale. It seems to help me have better words. It's NCCI edits. NCCI edits are published by Medicare as guidelines to their coding practices. NCCI edits contain services that are bundled together and should not be billed separately. Please note that not every code is mentioned in the NCCI edits, but should always be reviewed for information. Even though these edits are published for Medicare patients, many other insurances also use these guidelines. Okay, so guys, remember when we were talking about batches earlier, that everything that you bill is gonna go into a batch, and then you have to send those batches at the end of the day. The next morning when you come in, there's a tab in billing where you can check your NCCI edits and it, your clearinghouse sends it back and says, hey, take a look at these again. So that's where your edits or your NCCI edits are going to come from. It's very hard to explain unless you're billing, right? Because you're like, I don't know what any of that means, but you will when you start billing. Which of the following are common sense for a claim to be rejected by a primary payer? We have to select three. B. D. D. And C. And what? Look at E. Diagnosis codes are not linked to the procedures. Oh, yeah. 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 So we're going to go with A. Insurance ID number is incorrect. Date B. service mm. do not match the charges. And diagnosis codes are not linked to the procedures. Yeah, let's try it. Yay! <laughs> A claim can be rejected for many reasons. Some examples of claim rejection by the insurance carrier are the insurance ID is incorrect. Oh my goodness, y'all. I'm not even going to start telling you what a nightmare that is. Anyway. Hang on. I'm sorry. Celeste, what you, go ahead. I said you scared me for a second. You need to start talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean, what you got? As a builder, would you have to go back and correct those codes and everything for you? As a builder, when, to yeah, when it, the rejection comes back, it'll say yeah. member ID does not match. You right. have to go back and find the member ID that's correct, put it in, and submit it as a corrected claim. Yeah, okay, okay. But what do you do when what the, okay, so you say that a claim is rejected for member ID number and you get on Blue Cross Blue Shields portal, portal and you put the exact number that Blue Cross Blue Shield has in their portal on your claim and you send it back and it's still rejected. So then what you do? I don't know. You asked me. I don't know. Because it's happening to me right now. And I'm like, but he's on your portal. He's eligible for this data service and for these procedures. Uh -huh. Girl, I can't even tell you. You get on the phone with Blue Cross Blue Shield and you say, what is going on? Right. Okay. Okay. You want to hear something else funny? What is? Most insurance, insurances send you to what's called IVR. Uh -huh. It's a voice recording where you can talk to the Oh, yeah. the robot yeah blue so cross you don't speak blue to one directly oh this messed up blue <laughs> cross blue shield starts with three letters try yeah. telling the ivr a x d <laughs> i'm sorry i did not recognize what you were saying please say it again oh see this you a can't touch the keypad x D. They don't do the keypad. So what do you do? You um, can't get through. One day you don't like, do the, one day they like, don't do the keypad. Yeah. You know how sometimes they let you touch the alphabet on the keypad? 
They don't do that. That's messed up, Miss Marcia. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, <clears throat> last week I finally got to a person and was transferred okay. seven times. And by the time I got to the eighth time, it was to the original person that said that she could help me. And she still couldn't help me. Oh, my. See, me had, it'd be like that. I so, went through something similar to that with my auto insurance. And I was like, um, I was just trying to pay the bill because I know it's the way you can pay it over the phone. Right. Instead of going online because I couldn't remember my login credentials. So. I called an 800 number. Good, they just gave me to run around, but I just stuck with it. And then I finally got through. Well, for me, I went around in circles. I mean, what do you do when you can't get a hold of a person that can actually help you at, yeah. the, at the insurance company and the, prov the uh, provider portal that they give you so you can look for all of these things and what it's saying there isn't correct. Yes, you. Yeah, it's it's, yes. a, it's a head scratcher. But anyway, we're going to keep going. I just had to vent with you guys about <laughs> about that. The joys of being a so, could they get in trouble for not uh being in compliance or not having a correct procedure in a database? Um so, could they get in trouble like Blue Cross Blue Shield? Could they be penalized or something for not having the proper information? Or why? Well, I don't know. No, I don't know. the only thing that I can do is I brought the uh, the claim to the uh, provider, which is the doctor's attention, and gave her uh, detailed notes of what I had done to try to get this taken care of. And then mm -hmm. now it's just kind of out of my hands because there's nothing, yeah. nothing I can do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I see. But okay, so let's go to number 15. The patient information section of an encounter form contains, okay, patient information section, diagnosis codes, date of service, for, uh, physician signature, and treatment codes. How many we know? How many we know? Just one. Just one. A. Um, a? I say it, it could be A, B, and D. <laughs> uh, Let's go with A or B. Yeah. Let's try A first. Or B. Yeah. Yeah, his diagnosis code will be on our side. Okay. I had to read it again. <laughs> I mean, they yeah, all look like they could have pertained to it, but yeah. Well, stop and think. There's no reason for them to have a, a, a claim if the date of service isn't. Um, you know, um, yeah. the patient information mm -hmm. section of an encounter form includes the patient's name, date of birth, and the date of service. Good idea. Okay, number 16. Which of the following is required information from the encounter form necessary for re insurance reimbursement? Mm -hmm. Date of service, procedure codes, Physician signature, Hicks Pick code, or authorization number. Uh, B. B a procedure code. The physician e. signature. C a physician signature. And, and D. I say e. Oh. So, no, we're not always going to need Hicks Picks codes, but take a look. Let's look at what we have. We have the date of service, right? Are yeah. Are they okay yeah, without a date of service? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, B, C. Yeah. Let's see what those. Date of service, procedure codes, hip. Oh! So B A B and D and he speak B and D A, A B and D. D. Yeah. Okay. So oh I I I am not for test taking purposes. I don't know if all of you have heard me say this. Sometimes the book learning of billing and coding and the mm -hmm. real world of billing and co coding are different. <laughs> I don't agree with this question, so I'll get it wrong every time because it's not right. But for this particular thing, data service, procedure codes, and Hicks Picks codes, you cannot get a claim paid without a physician's signature. 
And 98% of procedures, procedure codes must be authorized by the. That's what I thought it was the authorized. Yeah. <laughs> Again, real world building, billing versus encoding versus, you know, it's books. Books, the book stuff. So there you go. All right. Again, three answers. <laughs> Which of the following should the insurance encoding specialist verify upon receiving an encounter form? What is an encounter form? You go to the doctor, he fills out that thing and hand, you know, hands it to the person at the counter. So A, the assessments, yeah. Date a service B, and D provided service. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. What? Yes. Great <laughs> job! Great job! I love to hear y'all talking about it because you're working out the answer. I, I love to hear how, how y'all are working it out. Okay. The multi-purpose billing forms should be reviewed and updated to include new or revised codes quarterly. Every day. <laughs> You're not going to get <laughs> revised codes every day. I'm quarterly. Let's say quarterly. Everybody want to say quarterly? Yeah, you said now Is every day. Yeah, I would say that. Quarterly. Every couple of months. Is it monthly? Oh, it's annually. It may be yearly. Check. How often do your CPT, uh, your updated CPT and ICD-10 manuals come out? Every One year. Oh, oh, every this, year. This. Every year. And that's this where you're going to get your updated codes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I got it's you. Annual. <laughs> yeah, it's annually. Okay, so CMS 1500 form. Okay. I remember that. I know, I'm trying to think back. The secondary. Oh, oh. oh hang on. Let me. I just want to kind of show y'all a CMS 1500 form. Uh -huh. I remember that. Yeah. It's been a while. It's mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so this is what a CMS 1500 form looks like. Mm -hmm. So um, most of the time this is filled in electronically. So, but whenever you have a claim that's kicked back and I tell you you have to uh, um, update the claim and rate the minute, you would, your facility is gonna have a way for you to do this. So up here, it's what type of insurance, 1A, insurance ID, all the insurance information, date of birth, sex, name, address. Um, again, most of this is private information or information on the patient. Um, this is where the patient finds. Now this next portion, like from 14, all the way to 23. This is where you're going to be talking about illness, injury, ICD-10 codes, um, and the most important thing, prior authorization number. Y'all, if, you if it's authorized, you have to put it in there. But I want to tell you about the resubmission codes, but I don't want to do it now because it's fairly... Um, it's not complicated, but it's much more than we want to go in today. Um, but prior authorization. Now from 24, A, all the way through J, this is where your date of service is, your place of service, which means office, uh, home, telehealth, goes here. Then your procedures codes and your modifiers. And then how much it's charged. And all of this is automatically like the charges and stuff that comes from a fee schedule that's already uh, in your provider's system. So it will automatically populate. Okay. And down here is your uh, service facility, your billing provider information, and NPI numbers. We'll go over NPI numbers another day. And this is where the physician has to sign. So let's go back to what our. Okay, when completing the CMS uh, 1500 form, 
where should the patient patient secondary policy number be placed? Hang on just a minute. My heater is baking me now, so I have to turn it off. <coughs> Sorry, I have to scoot it towards me so I can get it. All right, so let's look at the secondary policy number place. So let's go back. Let's look. So it said 11 and 1A. So let's look at 11 is insurance policy group. And 1A. Nine A and nine and nine. Other insured's name, other insured's policy, or group number. Nine A. So y'all yeah. got nine A. Yeah. Yeah. But how hey. would we have known if I wouldn't have pulled up that fifteen hundred? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We are going to be going over those 1500 forms. I promise um, you're going to get sick of looking at them. So we did one through 19 today. Next week, we'll do 20 through 38. Did you guys learn a lot? Yes. 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 But it was just going a little too fast for me to write it down. I can't wait to go back over the uh, record. I'm going to take my yes, time. I'll, and as soon as some clear up. notes in my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, when, when, we are, when we are done, I will upload this to YouTube. And it does take time, guys. Sometimes it moves fast. Sometimes it moves slow. Oh, yeah, I um, and I'm going to say it might be a little later because I got to go vote. Are y'all voting today? I voted. I know. I have to go vote. I did. Oh, earlier on. You already went? Okay, see, I'll be waiting later to the evening, in the evening time, because I usually be at work around this hour, so when I get out of work by two or three, I should go to the poll. I'll get up with. Yeah. Okay, well, guys, we have live lecture at four o'clock on a Thursday. We're going to be going over okay. chapter, I think it's 26. It's. Yeah, we have chapter 25 test tomorrow. Yeah, it's and tomorrow or Sunday. It's, it's, well, it's scheduled not for tomorrow, but it's not due until Sunday. Okay, yeah. Okay, good deal. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah, we'll be. I will be lecturing on Chapter 26, I think. I'll be lecturing on something on, on <laughs> Thursday. But you know, you know how I do things. We'll do, do a little lecture. I do have Contempo coding. Um, it's vaccines. We're hitting vaccines yeah. is where we're, what we're going to be talking about. I have a quick video mm -hmm. with Contempo coding on there, and then we're going to code a few so that we can get the feel. Um, do not get overwhelmed with vaccines. I know it just seems foreign, right? But remember, we just have to understand enough to get through our exam. If you are a pediatric billing and coding specialist, you will get specialized training from them. They will have a cheat sheet for you to code from. You probably won't even ever open your CPT manuals or it will be electronic. So I want you guys to understand, we do need to have a bit of an understanding, but we don't have to be experts, right? Mm -hmm. Don't have to be an expert. Yeah. So anyway, okay, guys, we'll have a wonderful day. I will see you on Thursday at four o'clock. And if you need anything, let me know. Yes, ma'am. Bye. It was great Bye. to see you guys.